Welcome to The Crunch with Crib. I'm Jess and each episode I'll be talking with some of WA's best real estate agents and business people to find out what makes them tick and what lessons they've learned on their journey to success. When it comes to talking about respected industry figures in WA real estate, people don't come much more respected than Alan Burke of Burke's Real Estate. Late last year, I learned that while Alan still steers the ship at Burke's, he had been unanimously voted off the sales team by his staff. This story prompted our 2020 special on generational change, so I invited Alan and one of his leading sales reps, James Thompson, to join me on the show. James has been selling real estate since 2006 and is consistently ranked in the top 1% of real estate agents nationally, and to have both James and Alan in the studio together was a lesson in how to do real estate and life with respect and authenticity. Gentlemen, welcome into the Crunch Room. Thank you. Thanks for having us. For our our second episode of uh, of the year. I'm very excited to have you guys here. So as we uh, mentioned after our first episode, in our first episode, we're doing a bit of a special rolling into 2020 about the generational change in real estate. And you guys actually prompted me to do this subject because I caught up with you at Ari Bar Camp and, uh, and James was telling me how you... Uh, you guys kicked Alan out of sales. Out of sales. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he hasn't quite let go yet. But, no, uh, it's a tenuous grasp. He's trying to I'm wrench in. his hand <laughs> off the sales <laughs> baton. That's right. yeah. But that's what prompted me to want to do this this kind of little series. So thank you very much for the inspiration. Oh, thanks for inviting um, us. To get things started, I want, I'd like you both to tell me about your first sales, your, your very first sale in real estate. Well, why don't you go first, Alan? Because yours was a lot. Uh, yours was probably before I was alive. Oh, that's scary. Yeah, that's 40 years ago, so yeah, well and truly. <laughs> um, I sold my first property to a mad Irishman, um, and it was in Ardross, and uh, I gave him the roadmap. We didn't have GPS in those days. I gave him the roadmap to direct us to where we were going, and he said, you go right. And I said, I know, turn right. Go the other right. And I went, what's that? <laughs> he goes, left. So, oh, they go right, you go the other one. What's that? Left. So this this hand here is either the other one or the other right. Uh, anyway, we found it and he bought it, and after forty years, he's still in the house. So oh wow! I there remember you go. it well. We we just got there. <laughs> How many houses did you have to show him before you uh, before you saw that one? Uh, I think about eight or ten. He then decided he'd put an offer on it. He changed his mind the next morning. We went back and another look at it. He then bought it, and he's been there for forty years. Beautiful. Yeah. Mm. There you go, James. Um, I was 19 at the time, so not that long ago, and (laughs) my mum went to Medibank to take out private health cover for me, and she got talking to the attendant and learned that she was about to put her house on the market in Como, so I guess as any mum would, she whipped out one of my business cards and handed it over to the lady and said, you should give my son a call, he's a real estate agent in Como. Um, long story short, I listed it and sold it after the first home open, <laughs> and the buyer of that property has since referred me probably ten or fifteen listings over the years, and I've sold several more for him since. So, oh wow! Yeah, thanks, thanks mum. Thanks, mum. <laughs> thanks, mum. <laughs> I haven't thanks had for a that. referral since, so <laughs> I'm gonna have to have a word to her after this. <laughs> Alan, tell me, I guess we're talking about kind of mentoring agents and mentors and mentees and that relationship. Tell me what are you, men, mentees, that's the word, isn't it? I like tell, that. When you're, uh, what are you looking for in an agent, I guess, that you're employing at Burke's for starters, but then more specifically if you are taking on kind of a mentor role? Yep, okay. What our core values in the company are, are three things, authenticity, excellence and respect uh-huh. uh, from the book called The Legacy. Um, so we look at those core values to make sure that they're in harmony with what we do. Um, everyone we look at is, is a great question, you know, the why. So the, the person's got to have a good why, they're going to be successful. Uh-huh. Um, they've got to have ambition, they've got to have that excellence that we want to see. Um, so if they've got focus, ambition and drive, we can teach the rest. Uh-huh. So, but ideally they've had some form of selling experience or had, had their own business. But if there's a driving reason why they've got to be successful um, and, and coachability, mm-hmm. that's the big one that uh, um, we can teach. But if they don't want to learn, then we're obviously an exercise in futility. But uh, if they, it's like um, Richard 
Branson. Virgin, Richard Branson, thank you, from, from Virgin. You mm-hmm. know, choose on attitude and, and you can train the rest. Mm-hmm. I'm actually just reading his book at the moment again for the second time. Sounds like I was lucky to get a job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell me how often you um, – those things are, are difficult to pick in a person without knowing them well. How often do you get it right and how often do you get it wrong? I think I get one in three. I think that's my ratio. That's I all think right. That's about an industry ratio. Sadly, yeah. you, you employ three and keep one. Yeah. And and the people always interview well, and you do all of the tests and whatever else. Reference checks. And, and... Uh, some it's a hard gig. And it is. Uh, if if someone can quantify the right and wrong, we'd all save ourselves a fortune and a lot of heartbreak for all concerned. Um, but it's not an easy profession. I think we. We almost seem to be the employer of last resort in, in certain things that, uh, well, I can't do this. There's always real estate, but it's a very hard hard job mm. and uh, we chew a lot of people up. Yeah. When somebody says to somebody, you've got the gift of the gab, you should get into real estate, I think that's setting them they up don't, for failure. Yeah, well, they don't have an understanding probably of what it actually takes. Yeah. Um, you mentioned a book, The Legacy, that you'd built your value, your business values around. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah, in the legacy, which is about the All Blacks, their their mantra is humility, excellence and respect. That's their three uh, mottos of the All Blacks. We looked at the humility word and decided that authenticity was more more important to us. We wanted real people. um, You know, uh, people can spot a fake very quickly. um, And humility in real estate is important, but we think authenticity was more important. Mm -hmm. So we went with authenticity, excellence and respect. Beautiful. Yeah. Love it. James, tell me, um, the, I guess, the reverse of that question for you. When you were looking for, a, a an employer but also a mentor, what what were the qualities that you were kind of looking out for? Sure. Um, I suppose that reputation obviously counts for a lot mm-hmm. if you're making a decision about working for somebody that mm-hmm. you've never worked for before. And obviously, um, Alan's reputation still does precede him in the industry. Yeah. For me, a great mentor should be an engaged listener, mm-hmm. uh, someone who's empathetic, you know, understands the trials and tribulations of the day-to-day real estate grind, uh, someone who provides solutions, leads by example, and really inspires the team to achieve more. Um, I think from Alan's perspective and his and my relationship has obviously blossomed more into a friendship now than a, mm-hmm. a business relationship, but... I think you've got to teach people to want to be or to become better humans before they can become better real estate agents. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's something that I'm still working at but have come a long way at thanks to Alan's mentorship as well. Beautiful. What's something that uh, – because you're in a position now, as you said, you've kicked Alan out of sales and <laughs> – It wasn't so just me, by the way. It was a group <laughs> consensus. <laughs> it was unanimous. That, the hands were up before I'd finished the question. <laughs> um, but you're in a position of leadership now. So are those values that, uh, you know, Alan's brought into the business, is that something that you're really looking, you know, that you really live by now also? Yeah, I certainly um, try to live by those values from a personal and a business perspective. Real estate's really interesting because my experience is that somebody that's a high-performing salesperson is actually really a high-performing leader or manager mm-hmm. of people. Um, maybe Alan's the exception to that rule. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're very different roles. Yeah. Aren't they? So I suppose you know leadership from my perspective is about sharing what's working well for me mm-hmm. and what's helping me to have success or my clients to have success, um, and leading by example. Um, there really isn't a substitute for hard work in this business. Yeah. Um, so hopefully that's rubbing off on a few people. Yeah, awesome. Alan, You obviously we're focusing on generational change. I wondered if there's anything that you've seen James or anyone else in your office kind of trying new technology over the years or anything like that that you thought, absolute rubbish, that's never going to work, and then you've had to eat your words. Oh, look, I... Uh... The funny part about it is sometimes you can do something and it doesn't work. And that's uh, never, you know, in a lot of companies they said, oh, we tried that once, it doesn't work. And therefore that avenue is shut. Um, that's not our idea. Certainly in our office, there was, there might have been great ideas that, that didn't work that now do work. In a lot of cases, there's great ideas that people have just forgotten about um, and they always worked. And, mm-hmm. and I don't know, it's great question in, in any real estate company, you go, how come we're stopping doing that? That used to always work. And, mm-hmm. and it's 
Normally oh, after Eric or something like that, isn't it? We yeah, go, right. we, we used to do that. Yeah. We do that. So, oh, we used to do that. Why, why aren't we doing it? And it just gets dropped somewhere a lot. Um, and it's sometimes because new staff come in and, and perhaps the training wasn't as, as thorough in the in the new people. And then sometimes they say, why aren't we sending those things out or whatever it was? And they go, mm-hmm. oh, no one told me to. So yeah. um, we're all the time experimenting with, with new marketing ideas. Um, as David, David Ogilvy said years ago, 50% of advertising doesn't work. We just don't know which 50% it is. <laughs> um, so we're, I guess nowadays as we move into a digital space, we can monitor it a lot better than the old days where you'd um, throw up a banner or a sign or a billboard or something and never really knew the results. So mm-hmm. um, we're moving into a far more um, analytical and accountable space with yeah. marketing and that'll be exciting. Yeah. What about the reverse, again, the reverse of that question, things that you've done for a long time or, you know, um, James, that you may have seen that were things that we just did in the office we could because we've always done them and then upon investigation thought actually why do we do that rather than why why have we stopped doing that? Are there any of those things? I think there's probably in more recent times the digital versus traditional print paper mm. type mm. Um, media and advertising that you do. I think that the letterbox is probably going to become a redundant thing mm-hmm. very soon if it isn't already. Do you uh, guys find, because you, you sell kind of around South Perth area and, and you know, a lot of the population there may be a little bit older and are still, that seems to be something I hear from agents all the time. Well, I sell in an area where the demographic's slightly older and they do check their letterbox. Is that still the case for you guys or are you really seeing like it's a dying thing? No, it's still an important layer and I think that's yeah. what it's all about. None of it's going to work in isolation. Exactly, it all works yeah. in combination. Yeah. Um, and I'm still getting occasional calls from people that say I got something in my letterbox or I have been getting stuff in my letterbox from you for 15 years. Mm-hmm. And that, if that's the opportunity that gets you in the door, then it's an opportunity that you wouldn't have had before. So we're probably not investing as much time or money in that because it's less dollar productive than mm-hmm. digital or social media, mm-hmm. but it still has a place. Yeah. And I think it's just all part of branding. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, we're a lot more focused. If we're going to put something in a letterbox or a mail out, we're not doing thousands of them, we're doing hundreds. Yeah. So uh, we, we spent a lot of money on magazines and whatever else into thousands of letterboxes and it just wasn't producing results. So we're mm-hmm. much more focused. I guess in any form of advertising that you do, the message is really critical. So if the yes. message is, look how good I am and look how many awards I've won and this is why you should call me, chances are you're probably not going to get many of those calls. No. But if you ask a question that solves the problem for the person on the other end and that prompts them to pick up the phone, then and that's what it's all about. It really has to be about them yeah, and why, 100%. why you can help them. That's my big focus for this year is what is the problem that we're solving for you rather than look how good our products and services are. Yeah. Well, so. there was a lovely statement years ago that everyone's tuned into the radio station WIFM, what's in it for me. So as long as you're broadcasting with that frequency in mind, your message will get across. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Probably half of the listeners to this podcast would know what he's talking about. <laughs> 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 I think they'll figure it out. Um, tell me, both both of you can answer this one. What's a, what's a new habit that you guys have maybe implemented in the last couple of years that um, that's really changed the way you work or your life in general, personal or professional? I think it has um, correlation between both business and personal um, for me. And again, this has probably come from uh, mentorship from Alan and I focused in recent years on being a better listener mm-hmm. rather than making statements. Yeah. Um, focusing more on a client's individual needs and their goals and then providing a tailored solution to whatever their problem is. Mm-hmm. Um, so before every appointment or phone call with a client, I remind myself that the word listen is just an anagram of the word silent. Um, and that seems to have worked pretty well. Yeah, right. Um, on my side, I, I used to always take the kids to school. Now they're growing up, so I get an extra hour a day nowadays. So for me, that extra hour from 7.30 to 8.30 is, uh, is changed a hell of a lot for me. So mm-hmm. I can get my day in order before a large chunk of people come in. Um, and I like to have half an hour of that on my own at, the, at a coffee shop and mm-hmm. do some good reading. 
Um, so at 7.30, I'm ready to roll. Yeah. Yeah. So well, that's given me one more productive hour a day. It's such an important time of the day. That mm. morning we have it in here. There's a couple of us that get in nice and early and so nice and quiet and you can get so much done. Um, James. What is the most valuable piece of advice that Alan has uh, has ever given you? Can you remember it? We were laughing answer, on the answer no. <laughs> we were laughing on the way, we were laughing on the way here because I had to ask Alan what was the most important piece of advice he'd ever given me. Um, this is why I give you the questions beforehand. Yeah. Well, we've, we've worked on this for twelve hours and we still can't come up with it. <laughs> um, it's because we haven't had a glass of wine yet. Anyway, that's when we come up with our best <laughs> ideas. Um, I spent a short time. A few years ago, a long time ago it seems, working for another real estate company and within that company there was a heavy focus on systems and scripts and dialogue Mm -hmm. and when I came back to Burks, fortunately they had me back, Alan suggested that I should be less robotic. Yeah. Um, And you probably don't recognise that you're doing it at the time but with the benefit of hindsight now I knew that it was, I was probably like talking to a robot. Yeah. Um, and so he said to me, look, the most important thing to do is just to be authentic and be real. Mm-hmm. Just be yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, and no, that's not going to mean you get all of the business all of the time, but um, that's had a pretty profound impact on my business and probably for me personally. Yeah. There, there is a statement in this industry which is wrong, fake it until you make it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And especially for someone new in the industry, you know, in, the, in their 20s, they, they think they've got to be a mini-me of somebody else. And it can get spotted by people in a heartbeat. So mm-hmm. you've got to be real. You've got to... You know, if you're new to the industry, you, you talk about your enthusiasm and your energy and whatever it be, okay, you're not going to be as experienced as, as an old vet, but um, enthusiasm will always win over experience. Mm-hmm. So you, you are a fantastic asset just emanating enthusiasm. Yeah. And I remember someone saying years ago, a sale is a transfer of enthusiasm. So if you can get that message across, you'll get listings. Yeah, well, there is an obsession, I think, in the industry too about having the right things to say Mm -hmm. and for a lot of people and for me probably in the early stages that was thinking about what I was going to say next yes when you're thinking about what you're going to say next you've probably missed the message of what the clients yeah well that comes back to what you were saying about listening Mm -hmm. and I think it's a really hard thing to do for someone that um, doesn't if they're new they don't have a lot of confidence and really um authenticity comes from being confident in who you are and what you know and what you can do yeah self-belief and and it understanding what, as we said before, the problem is that they want solved and then knowing that you've got the experience to offer the solution feels yeah. much more comfortable and helps you to engage a lot better. There's a thing called narcissistic listening um, and we've met a few narcissistic listeners in our time and effectively what that means is listening to respond rather than listening to actually understand. Listen and understand, yeah. And just waiting to butt in. Yes, Ooh. yeah. I am... Um, have a journalism degree and I always say that the most important thing that I learned in that degree was how to listen Um, and it carried me through sales jobs and everything else because that's the, you know, as a journalist, that's what you have to do and you don't know. As a salesperson, it's exactly the same. Exactly, yeah. find out what the solution is or the the problem is and then you can come up with a solution. Exactly. Yeah, people really do just want to be heard. Yeah. They they want you to understand what it is that they're really saying. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, I guess you've kind of answered my next question, which is the what's the worst piece of advice? Um, and, Alan, you've just said fake it till you make it, but I don't. Well, yeah, the, the worst bit of advice, you know, from someone in the industry is is someone giving you advice outside their area of expertise. The number of people have told me this is a wonderful share, you know, a share portfolio, speculative share, get into this. <laughs> I have had so many bad decisions based on greed and, the, and not knowing that industry at all. Mm-hmm. Nowadays, I stick to the knitting. I just stick to real estate. Yeah, stick to what you know. James? Um, I once had another agent say to me, and I think we were at a property and I brought a buyer through. It's going back a few years now. But I remember him vividly saying to me, while well, the buyer wasn't there, <laughs> if you don't know the answer. Just make it up. (laughs) And now that I think about it, you know, that has so many different forms in real estate now. Some of the horror stories that I hear from clients about what agents may have said to them or told them that they should be doing sort of beggars belief a little bit. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, we try not to to listen too much to those things. Yeah. 
One of the questions I wanted to ask you guys, obviously you real estate agents are notoriously busy working on weekends, you're time poor, you, you know, constantly trying to squeeze in every little bit of the day. What have you learned to say no to over the years? And that might be um, requests from other people in, in the industry or buyers or sellers. What's something now that you used to jump at and now you say, actually, that's not worth my time? A listing. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, that's There's no motivation from the owner other than we need to get this price to sell. Yeah. And I fully appreciate that they're making nowadays very difficult financial decisions, a lot of them about selling for less than what they paid. But if the only motivation to sell is based on things which are outside of the control of me and the client, i.e. the price that's achieved at the end, then I say to them, maybe now's not the right time for you to sell. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't probably have done that in the past, but there's something quite cathartic about saying, I don't think I'm the right agent for you right now. Yeah. Um, There's an expression, not, not all business is good business. Mm -hmm. And uh, you don't have to take every listing. And, and you're crazy if you do. There, there's some that are deliberately, that shouldn't be taken up. Mm -hmm. We fall into the trap of just wanting to have another listing for the sake of having another listing. But yeah. then if you're spending all of that time with an unmotivated listing, mm -hmm. the opportunities that you're missing are probably quite numerous. A couple of other, yeah. I've Ooh. said to our sales team many times before that, there's no worse advertisement than a signboard with no sticker on it yeah. after a long period of time. Yes. So you might think it's great we got the listing, but without a sticker on it, people are thinking, well, maybe we won't call that agent because they haven't been able to sell that one up the road. So. Yeah. yeah. Are there any other incident, incident, incidences? Instances. <laughs> <laughs> Where you would say no okay, out of area life. or anything like that or is it? Um to a degree, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, if I didn't think that I was going to be able to offer the time and energy that the seller needed or really deserved, then there's lots of great agents across other suburbs that we don't typically service. I mean, to a degree, the internet's made us all local agents from the point of view of arriving mm -hmm. at a probable selling price or knowing where the local school is. Um, but if I th felt there was an agent that could do as good or better job, then I'd be happy to refer it to them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, we've actually got offers. We've got uh, listings and deals running on Christmas and Cocos Islands and Pemberton. And so wow. we do we do go far afield, but there's times at which we just refer it to a good local agent yeah. and say, look, you're better in that space than we are. You've got the buyers, you've got the database. Uh, let's refer it over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if mm -hmm. we're doing, you know, in some cases I'd be doing 25 home opens across Saturday and Sunday, having to add an extra half an hour or 45 minutes to travel time means that you can't fit that many home opens yeah. in. So specialising within a suburb or two means Always preferable. you can yeah. fit them in. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Is there anything else for you, Alan, that you've learned to say no to over the years? Certainly marketing money is uh, where some people say, look, we just haven't got any money. Can you put it, you spend all your money and then we may pay you later on. We mm -hmm. just say, no, I'm sorry. You know, yeah. We just can't do that. We, you know, you've got to invest in the marketing for us to take it on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think Shane Beaumont said something similar when he spoke at RE Bar Camp, and it's the temptation is to take it on because mm -hmm. you think you're going to get paid at settlement at the end, but they haven't got any skin in the game, as the, the yeah, expression that's right. goes. So they need to be invested. Well, his is a hard, hard and fast. Until we get that money in the bank, we won't list the property. So. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. your gut feel is always this doesn't. This is probably not going to end well, mm -hmm. um, and normally it doesn't. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, you've got to have that uh, degree of control on your cash flow. If, mm -hmm. if you allow the, you know, 50% or some sort of percentage to get involved in it, all of a sudden you multiply that times the number of listings and go break very fast. Yeah. yeah. And right. it also, I think, helps for the client at the other side to understand the importance of investing in, say, the marketing of their home. Mm -hmm. And if they don't understand that concept or we haven't been able to demonstrate it to them, then something else is probably wrong. Wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Not the right fit. Mm. Obviously, you've both been in the industry for a long time, and sales can be kind of a, a thankless task or a, or a difficult, you know, a difficult slog. What do you do when you lose focus? If you have over the years or had a, you know, a slump, I guess they would call it. What are some of the things you would do to? Well, I've always had a business plan, so mm -hmm. um, a lot of people have forty-page business plans they put in the top drawer, and, and they do it once a year, and they often need it for the bank. Um, I have a one-page business plan that is quarterized, if there's such a verb, um, whereby it's broken down into quarters and mm -hmm. then broken down into months. 
So if there's any degree of loss of focus, then I go back and look at the big picture, understand what we're going to do for the quarter, what we're going to do for the month, and it's all prioritised. So mm-hmm. it very quickly gets you back onto the right path. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. For me, this is very much an energy business um, because it's very demanding of your time and you know we're problem solvers for the most part at the end of the day. So you know that can be exhausting for me, the, the best thing to do to get refocused or re-energised is to have a little win. Mm-hmm. So to go and do something where we know there's going to be a positive outcome at the end. Mm-hmm. Um, and then having a great team around you is absolutely critical. Yeah. You know, if you're just not feeling 100%, but you've got a team member that you can handball something to that can take care of it, then I think that's really important too. Because at the end of the day, the client only sees the outcome that gets delivered um, they don't necessarily know what's happened in the background behind the scenes. And if, if someone's feeling a bit down or a bit depressed about everything, go and visit one of your best clients. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they'll lift you up. Yeah. So, um, you know, just have a cup of coffee and stay in touch with someone because it, we do need to keep that energy level very high. And yes. if you are, for whatever reason, dropping down, activity, sport, etc., is really important. Endorphins mm-hmm. are vital in, in bringing up your, uh, your state of awareness and, and positivity and just interacting with positive people. Mm-hmm. Very important. It's very easy to get distracted too, Jess, in this business. There's yep. so many things that you could be doing at any given time, but really there's only a select few that you should. Mm-hmm. So I think having a what I call an action list rather than a to-do list helps me to focus. And when you're focused, I think you're more energetic and you know, there's something quite fulfilling about crossing out one of those items on the action list, knowing that that's been done and you can move on to the next one. Mm-hmm. So planning is pretty critical in that too. What? Sorry, you were going to... I was going to say there was an expression once saying, uh, do the thing and you'll get the energy to do the thing. So often I'm by saying. starting it, you know, starting is, is 90% there. Yeah. 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 Eat that frog is a good that's book right. too yeah. by Brian Eat Tracy. <laughs> Well, as a business owner, Alan, I guess, um, I mean, I've sat in a boardroom with your team and they're all, you know, similar to James, high energy and, and kind of vibing off each other. But if have you ever kind of walked or, or had a month, you know, it's been a tough, tough year, tough market where the whole team feels low. What's your, I guess, response to that? Do you try and bring in someone in, in say, a trainer or a, uh, a motivator or a coach? Um, and we brought all those people in at certain times. Mm-hmm. Uh, I remember listening to an ARIC conference years ago and it was uh, Carl Lewis's six coaches, how many do you have? So he has a starting coach, a finishing coach, a fitness yeah. coach, a you know, da 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 coach. So often we'll bring people in as they're needed, you know, mm-hmm. and, and sometimes it isn't training. Sometimes it's just someone to hear them as a third party. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, energy is really vital. If, if you energy levels in your office are low, it's the boss's job to work out how to solve it because mm-hmm. the, the reps can only solve their own internal issues, but then the overall energy, uh, you've got to solve it very fast because mm-hmm. it can be very invasive. Yeah, yeah. and, and yeah. it can spiral out of control yes. fairly quickly. So for me, it's sometimes about reflecting on past wins you know, to get you know, the, the uh, juices, the good juices flowing so to speak, Mm -hmm. Um, or to focus on, right, well, what is the goal for the future? Mm -hmm. If if you're feeling down or lacking energy in a moment, then if you reflect back on something that was positive or look forward to something that is going to be positive, then you can change your state of mind Mm -hmm. pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah. And and humour is really important. Humour in an office, you know, there is... Our office is totally inappropriate many, many times, but there's... there's <laughs> All good there's offices a, there are. Yeah. <laughs> there is a lot of fun in our office, yeah. which is great. This is a really serious business, but it's also important not to take ourselves too seriously. Too seriously. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. So my final question for you guys today, and you've dropped a few of these throughout, so I'm interested to hear your answer to this one, but um, I want to know what a quote that you live your life by. I... I listened to lots of different quotes. I heard one of Yogi Berra just a couple of days ago, the baseball coach, and he said, forecasting is really difficult, especially about the future. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't work by a quote. I work by an affirmation. If I'm feeling a little bit distracted or whatever else, I've got a little mantra I say to myself, I'm happily, healthily, wealthy. And that just reinforces the direction for me. So that's what works for me. Now say Excellent. that twice backwards. I'm happily, healthily, wealthy. That's why you're <laughs> going to hear it only that way. <laughs> I'm a little bit of a freak when it comes to these sorts of things. I have got quotes laminated all over my office. Um, probably the one that 
is most important to me is whether you think you can or you think you can't, either way you're right, by yeah. Henry Ford. Um, yeah, that I think pretty much summarises you also success in the, everything. The harder I work, the luckier I get. So, you know, that's another good quote of Henry Ford. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Actually, one that I think is quite um, pertinent to our industry is when all is said and done, usually more is said than is done. So it's a pretty good one too. Beautiful. What a way to wrap things up. Thank you so much for your time, guys. Thanks for having us, Jess. That's it for this episode. Thank you so much for listening. We'd love any feedback or guest suggestions. So hit me up on Instagram. You can find me on Jess at Crib. And if you enjoyed the show, don't forget to subscribe and be sure to tell a friend.